So it's a, a great honor for me this evening to introduce our final speaker of the fall conference, uh, she, uh, Elizabeth Lev, American-born art historian who lives in Rome, lives and works in Rome. After finishing her studies at the University of Chicago, Liz moved to Northern Italy to do her graduate work at the University of Bologna. Shortly after her decision to reside in Rome, Liz began giving tours for a small cultural association and in 2001 passed the licensing exam for guides. And for those of you who, have, who live in this world, there is no one in Italy more sought after than Liz Lev in terms of shepherding people, stewarding them through beautiful art. <laughs> and the, uh, <laughs> it's true. It's true. I'm not exaggerating. Um, the same year, she began teaching art history at Duquesne University's Italian campus, where she continues to be a faculty member to this day. After teaching Renaissance art at John Cabot University for five years, she has since joined the teaching staff at the Pontifical University of the Angelicum in Rome, as well as, yeah, see, there's Dominicans in the house. They're getting, they're, getting, they're getting spicy on the third day. It's too bad that Father Thomas Joseph White, the rector, the rector magnificus of your institution, could not be with us, but he's with us in spirit. Um, she also teaches at Christendom College. When she's not teaching, <laughs> see how exciting? How fun is this? I'll just start naming institutions. University of Dallas. I'm just kidding. <laughs> See how it works? I'll be here all night. You're not ever going to hear her talk. Um, when she's not teaching, Liz can be found writing for multiple media and literary outlets. She's the author of three books, The Tigress of Forlì, Renaissance Italy's Most Courageous and Notorious Countess, Caterina Riario Sforza de' Medici, Roman Pilgrimage, The Station Churches with George Weigel, and A Body for Glory, Theology of the Body in the Papal Collections with Father Jose Granados. Liz has given a TED Talk on the unheard story of the Sistine Chapel and has appeared on many television and radio interviews from ABC's Nightline to Today, to Today Show. She was featured in the series Museum S Secrets for History Television, Brad Meltzer's Decoded, and was the host of Catholic Canvas, a 10-part television series on the art of the Vatican Museums, which aired on EWTN. In addition to these, Liz was the 2018 Miser Visiting Research Fellow at the De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture. So sit back and enjoy the wonderful, enlightening remarks of one of my very favorite people in the entire world, Liz Leff. <laughs> All right, well, hello everybody. Thank you for that wonderfully warm welcome. Um, <clears throat> I should tell you that while Delta did successfully deliver my luggage, I, I think it lost my voice, so you're gonna have to bear with me a little bit tonight. I am very, very honored to be giving this keynote this year, and if my memory serves, it was my mother who gave it last year, Marianne Glendon, and, woo! And, uh, <laughs> So I, I am very much aware that I have uh, big shoes to fill, but um, I did bring Michelangelo as my wingman, so I'm feeling kind of good. And I'd also like to give a special thanks, and, and a very, very special thanks in this case to the, to, to the conference, because this conference has been particularly um, illuminating, especially to me as an art historian who always feels a bit like an interloper um, in these conferences. But this, first of all, the incredible staff, Carter, Margaret, Laura, Dave, Petra, Ken, uh, and of course all the wonderful Soren fellows that have been omnipresent. Uh, this has been a really, really interesting thing because attending all the wonderful and fascinating talks that I have, every time I was listening to you, I kept seeing bits and pieces of the Sistine Chapel. And really, it was a, a really a joyous confirmation of the way that all of these, the joyous confirmation of the idea of terroir in art, that really art springs forth from these very, very different things that all come together to produce something beautiful. But I suppose I should probably get started with the actual talk right now, which starts with something along the lines of, you know, when Julius II dispatched a 33-year-old Michelangelo to the Sistine Chapel in 1508, it was to fulfill a singularly uncreative assignment. 
Painting the 12 apostles against a decorative field was the default decor for virtually every vault in Italy. And, but the Renaissance, it was an age of immense creative activity in the church, in the arts, in thought, and in science. So it was not to be expected that art's most explosive genius, Michelangelo Buonarroti, fresh from sculpting the Pieta and the David, would settle for some same old, same old, right? So this evening we're here to look at the perfect creative storm, the historical, artistic, and theological elements that combined in the Sistine Chapel during the reign of Pope Julius II at the height of the Renaissance and through the genius of Michelangelo. For most modern viewers, um, most much, much of that creative voice had been lost, or at least muted, under the patina of centuries of candle soot, dust, and neglect. I know the young people among, among us are kind of looking at this, this picture going, wait a minute, couldn't you find a decent picture? Um, this is what it looked like when I was studying art back in 19... <coughs> and... Um, <laughs> So there was a 1900, I was in it. And, um, and uh, when, when, when I started, this is what my books looked like. And so in a certain sense, I mean, it was hard for already, I can understand a little bit, it was hard for me as a student to get excited about something that's kind of grimy colored. But more difficult was the, the, the birth of art history. And art historians in the 19th century, they gazed at the ceiling through something that I could really only describe as cataracts because it was partially because the ceiling had grown so dark, but the other reason is that the secular neo-discipline of art history rejected the theological nature and purpose of the work. It was not until Pope St. John Paul II commissioned the 1981 to 1989 cleaning and restoring of the chapel that beholders were finally able to gaze upon the shining beauty, truth, and goodness that the chapel proclaimed. The glorious result, it, it inspired that Pope's own artistic creativity alongside his own theological acumen. During his homily at the unveiling of the newly cleaned frescoes in 1999, St. John Paul, speaking of the Genesis cycle, declared the Sistine Chapel the sanctuary of the theology of the human body, essentially turning this into an illustration of his 129 catechesis offered from 1978 to 1979 to 1984 that many of you have had occasion to hear referred to during the numerous talks during this wonderful conference. But also in 2003, John Paul II penned the poem Meditations on the Book of Genesis at the Threshold of the Sistine Chapel, a panegyric to creation, the creator, and the creative genius of Michelangelo. And it's through this prism that I want to talk about the Sistine Chapel tonight. And again, just a little bit of a tiny personal note. Again, as I told you, I, now I've given you the date, so that's a bit of a problem. But uh, I was studying art while this happened. And for me, the moment that my professor walked into my class at University of Chicago with a color transparency, you guys can go look that up in the library. Um, <laughs> It was a put came with the Delphic Sybil, and he said to us, we have to rethink Michelangelo. So really what that, that decision to clean the Sistine Chapel really was life-changing uh, for, well, me as well as many others. So what you're looking at is the great chapel of the papal court. It was built by Sixtus IV, who gave it its name in 1477. And it had already been previously decorated under that pontificate by some of the finest painters of the previous generation. Their stories, the ones along the side walls that you see there, they recounted the life of Jesus and that of Moses, and they unfolded in a cycle along the side walls of the chapel. It was a delightful ornament. It was filled with local monuments and kind of, you know, the, the Arch of Constantine, the Baptistry of Florence. It had contemporary portraits, including a recent engagement that had taken place. And there is like a Where's Waldo moment with a courtier's lapdog that shows up every couple of scenes. <laughs> and so, I mean, these are beautiful images and they're wonderful. But it really did ensconce salvation history in the milieu of a European court, and it reflected a European church. 
But Pope Julius II, the nephew of Sixtus, faced a very different world and a different ecclesia when he was elected in 1503. The discovery of the new world and its inhabitants expanded the church into unfamiliar territory, and theologians in the court were wrestling with how to preach the gospel to new peoples. In a sermon given in the Sistine Chapel, published by the late and lamented, he died this year, uh, Father O'Malley, SJ, um, the Augustinian preacher, Giles of Viterbo, exalted the church's destiny to, quote, carry the golden life of Christianity to peoples who had never known it, end quote. For his part, Pope Julius boldly expanded the mission of the church, creating Hispaniola, the first diocese of the Americas. The Genesis cycle in the Sistine Chapel reflected this mission, recounting the beginning of all creation, uniting peoples in their common ancestor of Adam and Eve, and the universal need for salvation. The genesis of the commission of the Sistine Chapel, however, remains mysterious because art's his, art history's only source for the development for the commission of the chapel is, of course, the artist himself, Michelangelo Buonarroti, who pithily describes the che, this life-changing task in a letter from 1523 to his friend Giovanni Francesco Fatucci, and he describes it as being permitted to, quote, paint whatever he liked, end quote. And this is after he had already rejected, he made a point of rejecting the Pope's previous proposal to paint the 12 apostles. The Pope says, paint the 12 apostles. Michelangelo says, no, that's going to be a poor thing. And so according to Michelangelo, then the Pope said, okay, do whatever you want. Now, we might want to take that with a grain of salt, uh, because Michelangelo was in the midst of creating something else in that period, something very personal and it was the legend of Michelangelo. And what we hear in that legend is a man who spoke to popes as near equals, a man who was sought after by kings and princes, a man whose thoughts, his thoughts, were as precious as his handiwork. That is what an artist is. He was creating the figure of the artist, that oft abused term in the modern age. So if a pop singer can wear a meat dress and call herself an artist, that is thanks to the efforts of people like Michelangelo. <laughs> I'm not sure what he would make of it, but that's neither here nor there. The spirit of artistic adventure led the artist to experiment with a completely new vision of creation. He took a book that had been painted, sculpted, mosaic and illuminated over and over again in the history of art and created something completely new. And John Paul II described his amazement before the completely original representation thus. He writes, it is the book of the origins. We are standing at the threshold of the book. It is the book of the origins, Genesis. Here in the dark, Michelangelo, I'm sorry, here in the dark, I don't know where that came from. Here in this chapel, I was thinking about art in the dark, but anyway. Here in the chapel, Michelangelo penned it, not with words, but with the richness of piled up colors. We enter in order to read it again, going from wonder to wonder. There was a 6,000 square foot space. The old starry blue vault of Pope Sixtus IV it had been scraped to a bare surface and yawned before Michelangelo, who was something of a novice to fresco painting. His proposal for the decoration propelled the Florentine into uncharted artistic waters. The cycle of stories this grand had never been attempted on a ceiling. Narratives are generally reserved for sidewalls where you could be creating a parallel world, you create images or a window into a parallel world. For three and a half years, Michelangelo worked with a minimum number of, of assistants. He was standing, not lying down on the garage mechanics things from the agony and ecstasy. He was standing. And he began at the far end of the chapel, the section of the chapel that was reserved for lay people. He was essentially hedging his bets so that by the time he would come to paint the image of God the Father, his hand and eye would be in perfect sync. So he started out by painting Noah on top of the lay people, which is a pretty good place to make a mistake, as opposed to God on top of the Pope. And so he must have been... 
uniquely attuned, uniquely attuned to the creative power of God the Father as he painted, starting with his brilliant, brilliant plan for organizing the nine fields of the narrative. He had been lured to Rome to begin with by Julius II. And Julius II said, hey, Mike, why don't you come down to Rome? You can pay 12 apostles in my ceiling. The answer would have sounded something like, oh, I'm sorry, my goldfish needs washing for the, for the foreseeable future. Never would have happened. But Michelangelo had been lured down to Rome with something else, with the promise of building a tomb. It was going to be a tomb, something that would be like the eighth wonder of the world. It was 40 foot by 20 foot freestanding monument. It was a colossal tomb for Pope Julius II. And he thought that this was going to be the culminating glory of a career that had already produced, as I said, the Pietà and the David. And he had all of his dreams frustrated by this seemingly minor task of this Sistine ceiling. So he rerouted, always a life lesson. I always think of this one as a life lesson. So instead of sort of sitting there and phoning it in, he rerouted all of that creative thinking that had gone into the tomb project into the ceiling. The pseudo marble architectural framework, the trompe l'oeil niches, and the fictive sculptures that fill them, even casting a shadow in some eras, areas, illustrate the mind of a sculptor architect bending the art of painting to his vision. Soon to be de rigueur for all ceilings, Michelangelo's plan for a sculptural architectural monument in which the medium just happened to be paint stunned the world with its innovation. His great of ima greatest imaginative force was manifested, however, in the human body. Daring to show God embodied, he filled the first three panels with the mighty dynamic figure of the Father at work. In the opening scene, which is the separation of light and dark, we see God captured by Michelangelo's brush after he has already started the process of bringing forth existence, he spirals in a very compressed space, and he's, he's, it, it, it conveys the sense of kinetic energy, and his, his movements are, are, are echoed by these four ignudi that you see that frame the scene. You can actually only see their knees and ankles because I made the picture too big. Um, the um, God looks like a whirlwind, pure dynamism, taking what God did with a word and representing it through flesh. And the way it works in the ceilings, especially when you walked in from the other side, God seems kind of blurry. He sort of emerges into your field as you're looking at him, but this kind of, this incredible intensity of energy. And in order to, to that Michelangelo's tremendous imagination co-opted an ancient pagan statue, the Laocoon, the celebrated first century image of the Trojan priest killed by sea serpents that had recently been rediscovered in the presence of Michelangelo in Rome. The twisting torso and the strained muscles that evoked torture and death in its own age were transformed by what Giorgio Vasari would describe as, and I quote, a demonstration of love and creative energy. From suffering and death to love and life, it was a beautiful vision of Christian creativity. Michelangelo took a Christian lens and he put it on a pagan sculpture and he transformed it from an image of death to an image of life. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI alluded to the power of the creative Christian lens when he noted in 2006 that, quote, the profane Laocoon acquires its fullest and most authentic light in the Vatican context. The next scene was larger, nine by 18 feet, almost double the size of the previous panel and even more surprising. From the right-hand side, God flies into view, one, figuring order, one finger ordering the sun into existence, the other one ordering the moon, and then he turns to fly away as he draws forth the vegetable life. This abundant creative activity, however, does not focus on the objects. It's not the stuff that God creates. He makes half a yellow circle for like the, the, the sun, makes half an orb for the moon, and the vegetable life, I mean, vegetable life, all created life on earth and the animal and the plant life, it, it would be four ferns. Like, count them. There are four ferns. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of getting the impression that Michelangelo, it's not what God creates with him. 
It's that God creates, at least in these opening scenes. While God is kind of making stuff, it's not so much what it is he's making. It's that he's making. And for as an artist who had to fight for his own creative career, the sheer act of making for Michelangelo shared in the spirit of creation. Again, John Paul II's poetry expressed this mysterious image where God occupies almost all of the pictorial space. Whoops, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I'm going to move up and then back up. Um, this is a, he is an ineffable space which embraces all. He, the creator, embraces everything, summoning existence from nothing, not only from the beginning, but always. Everything endures, continually becoming. So backing up to this image, um, it's the moment we have to address, if you will, the elephant in the room <clears throat> on the screen. Uh, much has been made of God's prominent backside in this image. <laughs> I'll take Vizari, Vizari, thank you, Vizari. He praised the virtuoso foreshortening, and he said that it continually turns and changes as you walk around the, ca the chapel. Others perceived it as a papal insult mooning the Pope who had given him such an unwanted task four and a half years after he'd begun it. Um, that idea, while well, charming, um, or at least amusing to 12-year-olds, um, is um, uh, mooning uh, does not translate into Italian. So like the humor would have been right over the head of everybody. Modern viewers like to assume that Michelangelo used the figure as an outlet for his presumed homosexuality, a kind of out and proud moment before the entire papal court. Um, how about I propose another idea? Um, looking below this majestic image, we can see the painting of Moses and the burning bush by Botticelli. Botticelli being Michelangelo's friend and in many ways mentor. Here, Moses has his first encounter with God in Exodus 3, where he's too frightened to look at him. He first he's in front of the bush, he sees the bush, then he realizes it's God, he covers his face. Um, but by Exodus 33, uh, things have changed a bit, because at this point, God used to speak to Moses as a person speaks to a friend, but seven, line late, seven lines later, that's not quite enough for Moses, and Moses is saying, show me your glory. And God's response <clears throat> is compromise for those responses immediately. You cannot see my face, for no one can see my face and live. But he comes up with the compromise for Moses, who he likes, and says, you can hide in the rocks, and you can, I will pass by in my glory covering you with my hand. And when I pass by, I will lift my hand, and you may look upon my, and the words are, back parts. So Michelangelo has just been showing us the Lord's glory. We have seen God flying across that ceiling. What else could prompt this audacity? except for the promise of the incarnation. For the theologians in the room, the most surprising element of this cycle is not, it, the most surprising element of this cycle is the emphasis on the first person, flying solo, visible, engaged, physically engaged in creation. God, as an older man, had started to make like a discreet appearance in Renaissance art. He'd been kind of like tucked away in a corner during the Annunciation, you know, kind of like in a little mandala, kind of poking out of the portal window. But I, this, this, when he is, when he was engaged, if they ever showed him engaged in the act of creation, they always showed him as the second person. The customary way the viewer of the Renaissance would have expected to see the idea of being in contact with creation, it would have been a sec the second person. Instead, we have this incredibly powerful father, this first person who is you know, moving around with such dynamism. So basically, what I'd like to put to you is that this provocative image of Michelangelo was really offering a preview, a preview of the incarnation, a kind of teaser trainer, a tra teaser trailer of the greatest feat of God's creation, which has become man and dwelling above us. It's like the, the preview of the movie you've always wanted to see. God coming, Bethlehem, one. So the following scene stops the action. From movement and momentum, Michelangelo brings us to stillness. God hovers over the chapel, frozen as he gazes downwards. 
And art history, as usual, we've tied ourselves into knots over this one. If you ever want to start a cage fight, just put two in a room and ask, hey, what's that third, what's that third panel? Um, <laughs> separation of land and water, one idea. The separation of earth and sky. Separation of celestial and terrestrial firmament, which I'm actually is pretty sure the same thing as the other one. But this can be summed up very easily in art historical terms. We don't know. So um, I'm going to propose another idea <laughs> again. Um, the figure is realized, just in a little art history speak for you, it's realized in a very complicated technique, which is called sotto in su, which means from underneath up. And it, it, the intention is to make God look like he's hovering above the space. The first two scenes have been a flurry of creation, like God is moving here, God is moving there. He actually looks like he's, he's, he looks like a blur when, he's, when you're standing at the back of the chapel. This image seems to be like a kind of pregnant pause. It's, as, it, it's similar to a caesura in poetry, building up drama for the next scene. So instead of reading creations, what art history likes to do, we like to read cre the creation scenes as like a checklist. Sun, check. Moon, check. Ferns, check. <laughs> wait, wait, now what? I I'd like to propose that we look at this another way, the way Michelangelo, a poet himself, might have looked at it, to sum up Genesis, sum up the most repeated line in Genesis. There he is, God hovering, looking downwards, and it comes to mind that repeated, repeated line, and he saw that it was good. He gazes down on the visitors to the chapel to this day, the continuing fruits of his creation that are gathered in that space. And that pause leads us to, of course, the creation of man, the most discussed, examined, overused, exploited. It was a toothpaste ad in Japan. <laughs> Yikes. Contested image in the history of art. There are two principal figures. There are no plants or animals or scenic backdrops. There's just God and the creature formed in his image and likeness. You have, um, they mirror each other, um, in each in a semi-reclined pose. But first man is, is, is very much in God's image and likeness, and yet there is a distinction between these figures. Michelangelo's rapid brush strokes, which are a sign um, that he was growing very familiar with the fresco technique, they give the impression, always he uses very fast strokes when he paints God, they give the impression of God in motion. Again, this idea of almost a pink blur. In the creation of man, Adam appears as a light figure against a dark background. His outlines are extremely crisp. The line is very firm in the painting, and it makes him pop to the eye. The same way if you're watching a movie, you can always spot the star in the, in the crowd scene, because he's lit differently. Adam is lit differently in the four panels. The lighting on Adam is different. They're meant to make you notice him. He's contrasted with God's energy. He seems somewhat listless. His extended leg almost sunk into the clay from whence he sprang. Um, he, uh, his arm it's outstretched heavily, it sits on the knee, and he almost seems to be looking like a snooze button on the alarm clock. You can't really say he's much up in Adam. <laughs> yeah. All right, it's 8.30. All right, so, um, um, so and, uh, and, and if you look again, and this is one of the things about Michelangelo's art, this is always, a, I always tell my students and everybody else this, you must always look twice. That's what makes him special, Michelangelo. There's always a little internal paradox in his art. Your first impression of Adam, okay, fine, he looks really lazy. Look again. Look at the muscle groups of that shoulder he's resting on. He's not sunk into his shoulder. The shoulder is flexed. Look at the muscle groups of that knee. The knee is not... The bent knee looks far more like a runner at a starting block. Michelangelo is suggesting a potential in Adam, one that simply hasn't been released yet. He's sentient, he's awake, but he has no will or strength or purpose to rise. He looks completely passive and dependent despite that incredibly beautiful form. And it's God who reaches towards man. Um, Michelangelo's stroke of narrative genius um, 
um, placed God's finger seconds away from the contact with Adam. It makes the beholder almost lean forward in his seat, waiting for that final act of creation, the divine spark, the breath of life, that will release that latent energy and allow Adam to take his place as the greatest of creations. This is the joy in humanity that permeates the Renaissance, already extolled by homilist Pietro Marci in a 1480 sermon delivered in the Sistine Chapel when he said, O oh man, take account of how splendidly God has made you. Your bodily form exceeds all others. It is the beauty of this gesture. The beauty of this gesture is that it seems, oh my goodness, there is something out of order here. Uh, the beauty of this gesture is that it seems more like an invitation than an order. While the sun and moon are commanded with an imperious figure, the gesture of God here is much, much gentler, almost using magnetism to lift the finger of first man to raise him up. But Michelangelo was not done. This gunned image of creation hints at even greater marvels to come. As God extends his hand towards Adam, his other arm curls around a female figure. She is closely connected to the Lord. His arm curls around her shoulders, and hers is entwined with his. She looks beyond the Lord to gaze at Adam and is an example of the exceptional elegance seen in both the Delphic Sibyl and the beautiful Queen Esther also in the ceiling yet her gaze is much more focused. Some interpreters have, interpre have identified her as wisdom, or Sophia of Proverbs 8. Um, wisdom, or Sophia of Proverbs 8. Um, um, some as Mary, and others propose her as the figure of Eve. So we're going to pause for a moment and take a look at these. Sophia, while attempting chores for modern interpreters, thanks to the line in Proverbs 8, I was by your side a unique craftsperson, delighting you day after day. But in that case, her one-time only appearance, only for the creation of man, seems somewhat lopsided in the construction of the work, nor does it add or lead to the following events. Moreover, in the Renaissance, wisdom, or rather sapientia, was associated with the second person of the Trinity with whom he made all things. There is also no tradition of representing wisdom in Renaissance art, not even in Raphael's Stanza della Segnatura, which was just a few feet away being painted really at the same time and was, I was, I was, I was dedicated to the idea of wisdom. So the, this interpretation of Sophia qua sapientia really leaves more um, questions than answers and furthermore disrupts the flow of the ceiling. Mary, on the other hand, is the dedicatee of the chapel and she's a more logical choice though the chrono chronological leap would need, need some explaining. Moreover, her gaze towards Adam is puzzling, as opposed to Mary, who we would be expecting to be looking at the Lord or at the child who is right next to her. So the most fitting identification for this figure would be Eve, the planned, the planned companion of Adam. She is not only a visible balance to Adam, but her gaze connects her more intimately with Adam than would be appropriate for either Mary or Sapientia. However, I think this figure is more nuanced than any of these suggest. Let's look beyond Eve at God's hand which comes to rest on a child, distinguishable from all the other cherubs supporting the Lord by his crisp outline and his direct gaze at the viewer. Michelangelo, in fact, actually gave God a second knuckle. Look carefully, God's got like two knuckles. Um, and that is a, that's usually a heads up that the painter wants you to notice something. Like, look here, I added a knuckle. All right, so, um, so as Hans Pfeiffer, again, of the Society of Jesus, who was profoundly influential on my understanding of the ceiling, he posited years ago that this child would be Jesus planned from the beginning of time to redeem humanity. In this light, the pieces begin to fall into place. The preview of the visible God in the back parts from two panels earlier take form and shape in the, prep, in the, in the, in the pre preparation of the Christ child. And this leads us into the most exciting theological territory of the Renaissance, the Immaculate Conception. The belief in Mary's spotless soul from conception appeared in the Middle Ages, was subject of discussion, was subject of discussion in the Middle Ages in the West, and was subject of discussion among the intellectual elite. 
Pope Sixtus IV, a Franciscan and a celebrated debater, i.e. the man who built the Sistine Chapel, had championed the devotion to this to the point where fi of fixing the feast on the universal calendar. He commissioned two offices to the Immaculate Conception, and he had himself buried in the chapel dedicated to the Immaculate Conception that he built in St. Peter. So he's like a big Immaculate Conception guy. Um, Julius II, his nephew, also a Franciscan, and Michelangelo, a third order Franciscan, knew the arguments that had been made by Don Scotus that explained Mary's salvation in advance, as it were. God's plan for humanity was complete at the time of creation, all having been foreseen. Therefore, the need for salvation was known to God. The incarnation was always going to occur. Mary was always going to be the vessel in which God would become man in this light. Eve's sin was celebrated in this very room during the Triduum with the singing of the exalted, no? Happy fault, oh happy fault, which gained for us so great a redeemer. Eve, pitted against the serpent, who you will see is also featured as a woman, lost the first battle, but Mary wins the war. This figure shines the brightest when it becomes a conflation of the two great mothers of the Old Testament and the New, the Eve and the New Eve. Even as God creates man, he's preparing for man's fall and eventual salvation through Christ, as St. Jerome writes, death by Eve, life by Mary. In the October 1990 Journal of American Medicine, Dr. Frank Meshberger proposed the swooping outline of God's cape as a cross-section of the human brain. Reinforced by Michelangelo's own well-known anatomical studies, his thesis sheds a fascinating light on this work. Not only does it suggest that God's gift of humanity was the unique awareness of the presence of God in his special place among creation, but it also evokes Don Scott his thesis of seeing into God's mind and his complete plan for creation from the beginning of time. This is further reinforced by the following scene at the absolute center of the chapel. There are nine narrative panels. Therefore, the creation of woman is the linchpin of the work. I used to say that's because Adam was only practice and God got it right later. <clears throat> or maybe I still do. Um, the, um, so surrounded by golden ribbons and flanked by prophets connected to the incarnation, on one side Ezekiel, who in chapter 44 predicts the virgin birth, and on the other side the Cumian Sibyl, who the Renaissance believed in Virgil's fourth eclogue, foretold the coming of Christ. The ponderous figure of Eve stretches across the space as God did in the previous images of creation, her body still emerging from Adam's side as he sleeps nestled by a tree, prefiguring the cross, makes a direct link between God, a direct link to God with her hands clasped in prayer. She is already an image of the church who will be personified by Mary and the physical connection between God and man in the incarnation and the sacraments. This presence of Adam and Eve united at the very beginning of creation opens the curtain on the final part of this talk, creation and complementarity. From Eve's appearance in the creation of man to the centrality of the creation of Eve to the temptation and fall, Adam and Eve are always together. And in 1995, to letter, in his 1995 letter to women, St. John Paul II explained that, quote, the creative act of God takes place according to a precise plan, end quote. He wrote that, quote, woman complements man just as man complements woman. Men and women are complementarity. Womanhood expresses the human just as much as manhood does, but in a different and complementary way. Throughout this chapel, which at the time was restricted only to men, women weren't even allowed in until 1700, male and female figures are constantly paired, as we shall see, the temptation and fall interestingly marks the dividing line in the chapel. It falls exactly at the dividing line between lay people and clergy. In the two scenes, there are two scenes in this. This is the first part. Um, Michelangelo, not unsurprisingly, chose to eschew details of the setting of Eden. There's basically nothing in Eden. It's just as barren as outside Eden. 
Um, I think um, it, if anybody who's thinking it might be a tropical island paradise with a swim up bar, that was definitely not where Michelangelo's imagination was going, where he's going. But Adam and Eve within the garden in the state of grace are two of his most beautiful figures. They are filled with dynamism. They're buoyant. They're luminous. They suggest, those bodies suggest their immortality, but in different ways. We're looking at bodies that will never age, never suffer, never die, and their bodies complement each other. I mean, they literally complement each other. They fit together beautifully. He's a little ruddier. She's a little bit more languid. They compress this. They express this beauty, and their and then in their action, they really they fit together like puzzle pieces. John Paul II returned to this image many times over in his thought. He in poetry, he said. He saw omnia nuda et aperta sunt ante oculus eus, naked and transparent, true, good, and beautiful. He saw in terms so different from ours, end quote. And it was this image that prompted the homily that he gave at the unveiling of the frescoes when he said, it seems that Michelangelo in his own way allowed himself to be guided by the evocative words of the book of Genesis, which as regards the creation of the human being, male and female reveals, quote, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame, end quote. The Sistine Chapel is precisely, he said, if one may say so, the sanctuary of the theology of the human body. It was this work where we see this incredibly beautiful complementarity. And even in sin, it re reflects their complementarity. Adam moves more aggressively. Eve is more yielding, but they are even together in this act of sin. As they get kicked out of Eden, their relationship changes their bodies both transform, but they transform quite differently. They do it hunches over, she's ashamed. Both bodies lose their luminosity. Gravity seems to pull on those bodies. The body obviously and evidently becomes a burden to man in the post-lapsarian world. Adam's shoulder, however, seems to force Eve into the background, subjugating him in subjugating her into his shadow, into his shadow. In his Catechesis on Theology of the Body on March 5th of 1980, John Paul II pointed out that, quote, sin and death entered man's history in a way through the very heart of that unity, which from the beginning was formed by man and woman, created and called to become one flesh. Michelangelo, not distracted by the idea of a loss of a place, an earthly paradise, illustrated what sin wrought on the human person, and on his relationships. But the complementary, complementarity between men and women remained and is celebrated throughout the chapel. From the fall of man to the stories of Noah, we see a humanity drifting further and further from the Lord, but he sends prophets to guide his people. In the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo flanked prophets with sibyls, pagan prophetesses, whose divinations appeared to herald the coming of Christ, at least to the Renaissance or to his son's readers. The inclusion of these women allowed the Jewish tradition to be joined by that of the Gentiles, a sort of apologia for the Renaissance, but it also allowed for images of women to flank the male-dominated Old Testament images. They also alluded to the universality of the church and the divine plan for humanity. The Sibyls come from Asia, Africa, Europe. They, they spoke to this church, this universal church, a prophetic preparation for the known to the known world for redemption. Michelangelo was not the first to paint Sibyls. It was his former teacher, Ghirlandaio, who had first, re first, first unveiled these mantic women in the Sassetti Chapel in Florence. But were most depicted the Sibyls with a cookie cutter kind of starlit look, Michelangelo gave each one individuality and presence. The youthful, impetuous Delphic Sibyl is whirled away um, from the others. The Ectrean Sibyl with her sort of strong arms, beautiful look. Uh, the Libyan Sibyl, who is the exceptional figure of the Sistine Chapel ceiling, described by Giorgio Vasari, after having written a huge volume drawn from many books, she is 
about to rise to her feet in a feminine pose, and at the same time she shows her wish to arise and her desire to close the book, a difficult, not to say impossible detail for any other master except Michelangelo. These, the largest figures of the Sistine Chapel, guide your eye towards the altar again. This is the site of the fulfillment of all prophecies, and they are visual synergy between Jew and Gentile, Sibyl and prophet, man and woman. Connecting the lofty cycle of the ceiling with the sturdy earthbound walls are the pendentives, triangular fields which Michelangelo filled with stories with both heroes and heroines from the Old Testament. David and Judith at the entrance wall destroyed their enemies through decapitation, while Moses and Esther, who are above the altar, saved their people by means of a cross. David and Judith were among the first figures completed as he began the task of painting from this side of the chapel. Fully aware of his fame as the sculptor of the David, of the colossal David of Florence, Michelangelo departed from the heroic nudity and psychological interiority of his earlier version and depicted David about to deal the final blow to his enemy. Sword raised, David straddles Goliath, and Michelangelo's hasty brushstroke captures the culmination of this action story. These strokes, however, grow more precise and the depiction more detailed in the story of Judith. And as in the depiction of David, Judith is placed at the very center of the triangular field. And again, like her counterpart, a plain white background emphasizes the Jewish widow as the drama's protagonist. But in this depiction, the deed is already accomplished, and Judith and her maidservant are escaping with the head of Holofernes the Assyrian general. On the right, the decapitated body lies in the shadows in the midst of a final death throw. And on the left, a soldier sleeps heavily on his shield. The maid holds her head on the tray. She stoops to allow Judith to cover it. Judith is the only dynamic figure in the group. One foot elegantly poised, that like that Libyan Sibyl you just saw, she steps away from the tent but then she turns abruptly as if she's heard something. She, her, her heroic action is already complete, but she remains alert. In this pairing of scenes, David and Goliath, he, is, he's, he's, he, he represents something similar in the dramatic stories, but he adopts two analogous ways of telling it. David is in the midst of the ugly business of the beheading. Judith is portrayed as already having performed the exact same deed but with the brutal moment already passed. Michelangelo's storytelling is enhanced by complementing the aggressiveness with David with the more anxious and vulnerability of Judith. Michelangelo's work stopped along the top of the side walls and above the windows of the chapel. Below, the 15th century painters had painted a series of 30 popes, the genealogy of the papacy. To anchor his ceiling fresco to the viewer's dorm domain, Michelangelo painted the families that drove human history forward towards redemption by depicting the ancestors of Christ. The artist collapsed creation into the world of ordinary men and women. So from the ceiling, we have creation. Then we have these heroes. Then we have the prophets. Then we have ancestors. You're literally watching the invisible beginning collapsing into this rubber hits the road genealogy of men and women struggling from generation to generation. As a result, these figures seem more approachable. They're much more similar to candid family photographs than the studied exercise and artistic virtuosity that you see in the ceiling. These are the people who put the gen in Genesis. Michelangelo's genealogy of Christ traces the bloodline of Jesus from the patriarch Abraham to Joseph, husband of Mary. Taken from the Gospel of Matthew and covering 40, generation, 40 generations, the biblical passage notes each member of the male knot line, but only a scant five women are named, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. Michelangelo's version, however, already innovative as an icon iconographical decision, pairs each sculptural male figure with a female counterpart. In Somma, every father 
is accompanied by a mother. He produces a unique decorative cycle where, the, where you have fathers and mothers depicted together in the genealogy. The addition of 22 female figures defined by their motherhood provided the artist with a surprisingly creative outfit for costumes, poses, and even personalities. But more beautifully to me is that these 22 women, even though they don't have names in the gospel, thanks to Michelangelo, they all get faces. Michelangelo even added a boisterous display of children climbing, sleeping, nursing, playing, forming a refreshing ribbon of domesticity around the weight of the more formal scenes. The pairing of the men and women here return us to Genesis and the divine plan for the dawn of creation, reflecting on Genesis 2.18, when the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone, I will make him a helper as a partner. St. John Paul II wrote in his letter to women, when the book of Genesis speaks of help, it is not referring merely to acting, but to being. Womanhood and manhood are complementary, not only from the physical and psychological points of view, but also from the ontological. It is only through the duality of the masculine and the feminine that the human finds full recognition. To this unity of the two, God has entrusted not only the work of procreation and family life, but the creation of history itself. Michelangelo's representation of ancestry distinguished itself from all other precedents, not only in its inclusion of mothers, but also in their iconography. They're not represented as regal, distant icons of motherhood. These are busy, everyday women tending to toddlers, toddlers toilette, toys, and tasks. These, this, icono, this iconographic freedom is also felt in the ease in which he painted them. It took 520 giornate, that's the word for a day's work, for him to do um, the Sistine Chapel. That was the whole thing is 520 giornate. When he worked on the ceiling, the figures like the flood, when he worked on it's 26 giornate. When he's working on the Sibyls and the prophets, they're about 10 to 18 giornate. Six, six, hours of, six hours of time is a giornata. When he comes to the ancestors, the ancestors are painted in very large, about five and a half square foot fields, and he paints them in one, two, or three maximum <clears throat> giornate. So they're working very, very fast as opposed to the ones that you see up above. The other thing is he's not using cartoons. He's not putting up preparatory drawings. There's no sign of pouncing or incising. He's doing these works freehand. What that means is that he's looking and he's painting. It's the equivalent of of a photograph. He's using a new type of color technique where he uses contrasting colors like a green with a contrast in lavender, what's called shot silk coloring. And the restorers who cleaned it remarked that the practice of drawing and painting fused into a single moment. It was incredibly lively, incredibly innovative type of painting that he was doing with these works. And the result is that they have this incredible immediacy. And there are these wonderful observations of human nature. Um, Elizar's wife borrows a page from male fashions over there. You'll notice she's wearing the purse. I mean, she really does hold the purse string. Uh, she holds the key, which is the customary to the man of the house, and her husband's kind of looking a little startled by her as she's surveying solemnly her son, um, which, as the case in many Tuscan households, evidently the wife calls the shots. Others are a little bit more tender and intimate. Mishulameth, the wife of Masena, cradles her swaddled son while rocking another, in, rocking another infant with her foot. In an interesting view of complementarity, she's doing all the work and uh, Masena is sleeping. <laughs> um, this maternal multitasking, alien to the papal palace but familiar in the home, ended up immortalized in the Sistine Chapel. Illustrating the passing of generations, whether in Genesis or Matthew, necessarily emphasizes the beginning of children. Sister Prudence Allen, in her 2014 article, Gender Reality, writes, the root gen from the beginning of Judaism establishes the significance of the history of a people living in continuity generation after generation. It incorporates the act of sexual intercourse of a male and female, of a man and a woman who become father and mother in their synergetic union. Michelangelo's pairings and his genealogy in itself, the picture of essential complementarity required for a population to form and for creation to continue. And this brings me to the last image painted by Michelangelo 25 years after he completed the Sistine Chapel vault. He was summoned 
by Pope Paul III in 1534 at the height of the Protestant Reformation, a period of conflict and delusionment, the 59-year-old painter unleashed the terribilita, the awesome vision of the Last Judgment. But even at the end of days, Michelangelo looked back to creation, to the beginning. His shocking image of Christ, so powerful and so aloof, seems ready to consign his wayward creatures to the depths of hell. He has the stern visage of judgment, the instruments of the passion which are arranged above his head. They are a reminder that when humanity set itself as judge of God, they chose to flog him, beat him, mock him, crucify him. Yet even here, Michelangelo broke new ground, creating a completely different image of judgment and mercy. For the first time, he placed Mary next to Christ, nestled by his side, as closely connected as Adam and Eve in the ceiling panels. A foil to Christ's sternness, she is the picture of mercy, gazing down towards the elect. Placed by the wound in Christ's side, whence the church sprang, Mary is transfigured into the bride of Christ, for whom he gave his life and to whom he cannot say no. She is the conduit to Christ, as Eve was the link between God and man in the creation of woman. So Mary is the gateway to salvation, drawing us to Christ. She is the creator. She is the critical yet complementary role to play. Pope Francis, during spiritual exercise given in 2013, said the church is a mother. She gives birth to sons and daughters with the power and the deposit of faith. She leads ever deeper into the communion with the bridegroom, into the very side of Christ to sleep on the cross from which his spouse is born, the fruitful mother. And so here we have it, this incredible gift of creation that passes down from the ceiling, which begins with the very beginning of the world, this proliferation through the generations through which all of us, even today, are part of that creation and continuation of creation as we visit that chapel. And while there are many, many important things that one could say about the Last Judgment, especially in the month of November, I think I choose to conclude that in Michelangelo's vision of the Last Judgment, thanks to Mary, there are apparently no women in Michelangelo's hell. Thank you. <laughs>Thank you very much, Liz. I think we have, we have a very brief amount of time for a couple questions, if you're willing to take some questions, Absolutely. but we can also uh, preserve your voice. We'll, we'll take a couple questions, and then we'll continue our conversation in the, in the reception. So uh, raise your hand, and oh, here we go. There you are. So uh, got a guy from Benedictine right there. He's uh, an yeah, avid it's, questioner. It's Liam again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So my question for you, I appreciate you coming and talking, of course. Um, my question for you is, do you feel like um, because of his fr Michelangelo's frustration with kind of having to do this task, it may have opened up um, possibility, like an additional possibility for creativity, like some of the things he did were kind of jabs at the fact that he had to do it in the first place. Um, do you feel like this frustration maybe motivated him? So I think, um, I think he was very frustrated. It was very, we have endless letters about upset and frustrated he was. I, again, I think it's a life lesson. I use it all the time when I get a job so I don't really want. Um, and I feel like, why on earth? Why don't you know I'm better than this? Um, and, and I think that what Michelangelo did that was so extraordinary is that he used the fact that he was very concerned about building the Michelangelo brand. Um, and so he had to do something different. He couldn't possibly turn in a ceiling that someone would say, Oh yeah, maybe that was Gerald Dio. Wait, who's that guy who did the ceiling? He had to do something that would be his own. He used, he played to his own strengths and he came up with something completely different. So yes, he took a situation in which he felt put upon, deceived, frustrated, but he really, that's what great creativity is about. It's taking all that and turning it into, into this, which is really, I, I think, in, in many ways, Michelangelo's own example of how he took what looked like to be a nowhere job, and he created a brand new job out of it. So yes. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Zoe. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Um, I noticed that in the first um, couple of panels detailing creation, um, the separation of light and darkness, and the creation of the sun and the moon, God is shrouded in a red 
um, a red robe. And then when he creates Adam, he's wearing pink and the red is behind him. And I was wondering if there's any significance to that. I think he actually wears something that's very, very close to a flesh-colored robe for pretty much all of it. His, um, it's going to be hard to get all the way back this fast, but he wears for the, oh, look at that, we're going, so he wears this kind of, this pinkish color. It's sort of a flesh, it's a little bit deeper, I suppose, here, but basically it's the same, whoops, same type of color. Basically, we're seeing the way that the light reflects on it. So when we see him flying alone, so it's more the question of the shadows and the way that the light plays off, but he wears basically the same thing, except it becomes much, just a little bit lighter. It really shows off this body who, frankly, the world is not, was not, and is not ready for a nude God the Father. So... There was going to have to be some fudging here. So the lighting of the figure allows us to give that matching of the body without heading into territory where I would be just like, I can't talk about this place. Right? But I think that's probably the reason why he chose to do that. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Pardon if this is too related to what you just said, but is there any symbolism kind of to like the pink color? Is it just that it kind of looks like the flesh? Is that or why pink? It's, it's, it's actually that's that's a really interesting question, in which I go all over the place um, on this one because there's just not a ton of uh, there's not a ton of precedent of God, you know putting on his glad rags and hanging around with people. And so um, I, I think it really is meant to be a kind of preview for this, for this flesh color. Jesus himself will always wear red In Western art, for the most part, in the Renaissance, Jesus wears red closest to his body. And, and actually, I'm sorry, he wears, he, wears, he wears blue closest to his body, and then he wears the, the red around him, so he's cloaked in mortal flesh. So he's God, and he's cloaked in this mortal flesh, which is the red. And I think that's what we're looking at here when we see this kind of God cloaked in this, this flesh-like color. It's almost like a preview or a, a recognition of the fact that we are showing a God who will reveal himself in the flesh later on. Please join me again in thanking... Friends, that brings us to the end of the 22nd uh, annual fall conference of the DeNicola Center. But before we leave, there are some people that we need to thank. Uh, first of all, I want to thank my very dear friend, old friend, old in the sense we've known each other for a long time, Bill Hurlbut, Dr. Bill Hurlbut, who is uh, in many ways um, uh, the inspiration for this event and, and our partnership with the Boundaries Project at Stanford University has animated and I think amplified the, uh, the, the, uh, the experience of the fall conference in a very special way. So I'd like to thank, of course, Bill and everybody involved with the Boundaries Project. And I would also like to thank the John Templeton Foundation for their generous support of the Boundaries Project and of this and this event in particular. I would like to thank Amber Kirk and Lisa Vervinkt and all the Conference Center staff and all the extraordinary support staff on campus who make this event run so seamlessly year after year from every single person, from people in the conference office, from the people who, who uh, in, the, in the custodial staff, people who, who, who make everything possible. We'd like to remember them and thank them warmly. I'd also like to thank Dean Martin Kremers, who I see joined us this evening. Thank you for the use of this wonderful auditorium, and thank you for joining us this evening. Dean, Dean Kremers is the Dean of the Mendoza College of Business. Of course, I'd like to thank all of our wonderful speakers and guests, and of course, our students uh, from far and wide. We love having you here. Those of you who are uh, from outside of Notre Dame, from all the different colleges who've made the long trip here to spend these days with us, and as well to our wonderful and beloved Notre Dame students, uh, including in particular our Notre Dame Soren Fellows, who have been volunteering behind the scenes to make this event so hospitable. Let's thank the Soren Fellows one more time. <laughs> So those of you who have been coming to the fall conference for the past 10 years, you, it's now time to thank the staff. Uh, we have 
the most extraordinary staff, not just at Notre Dame, not just in North America, anywhere in, in thinking more about Simon, uh, Simon's talk yesterday in the entire galaxy, as, as broad as it is, as described by Robert on the first evening, there's simply, you couldn't find, and it's not possible that no matter the telescope you use, whether it's infrared or not, you will never find a staff that is as excellent as what we have here. They are excellence in fleshed. Um, and, um, and in particular, I would like to thank uh, Phil Tran, uh, Tommy Phillip, uh, Francie Aimoni, uh, as well as Katie Brizak, who uh, did so much early on uh, for the conference before starting her PhD and then presenting here at this event. Tracy Westlake, who has been the longest serving staff member of the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture. Dave Younger, recently uh, come on board to run our Soren Fellows program. Petra Farrell, who runs our Culture of Life initiatives. Ken Hellenius, who is the voice of the DeNicola Center in, in, in communications. Our extraordinary leader, uh, Laura Gonziorek, and defatigable Laura Gonziorek, who is the Associate Director of the Center. Our newly added Brooke Tranton, who uh, on her very first fall conference, uh, an extraordinary addition to this elite, amazing staff. But there's one staff member in particular who is the MVP of this amazing event year after year. And simply, there's, there's simply no comparison. Words fail to describe how extraordinary and excellent the staffer that I'm referring to is. And that is our very own Margaret Cabanis. When there, when there came a time for a fall conference, God made a Margaret. <laughs> so we are so delighted and pleased. Thank you all so much for traveling here with us. Uh, we've enjoyed being together. It's not over yet. There's a reception where we continue our conversation and enjoy fellowship together uh, uh, even more. But I just want to thank you from the bottom of all of our hearts. It's a very special labor of love putting this fall conference on. We're happy that you guys uh, have come to join us. Please travel safely. God bless all of you, and we'll see you next year.